In the Silent Hill fandom, it is generally agreed that of the eight mainline entries, the first four are superior to the latter four. Those latter four games are more maligned for a number of reasons, but of those reasons, there tends to be one that is held up above all others. They were made by Western developers. The argument generally goes something like this. There is a difference in style between Western and Eastern horror. Western horror tends to be more overt and gory, while Eastern horror tends to be more subtle and psychological. When Western developers got a hold of the Silent Hill franchise, their Western sensibilities clashed with Silent Hill's originally Japanese identity, which led to a decrease in quality. But is this true? Should we, as some people are doing, write off some of the new Silent Hill games that are coming out purely because they are being made by Western developers? Like with everything in life, I think there's a greater degree of nuance here than fans would like you to think. In my opinion, I do think that the latter Silent Hill games did suffer partially because they were made by Western developers. But I don't think there is something inherent to the Western psyche that precludes Westerners from making good Silent Hill games. After all, we have seen Silent Hill-esque games made by Western developers that were positively reviewed by both critics and fans. Most recently, we got Signalis, which I think is the best Silent Hill-esque game since Silent Hill 3. I mean 4. Then there are games like Soma and Observer, which I believe are masterclass combinations of Silent Hill-type horror with science fiction. And then there are older games like The Suffering, which I think succeeded in combining kinetic action with symbolic psychological horror that is typical of Silent Hill games. Due to the success of those games, I believe Western developers could handle the Silent Hill IP well, and we shouldn't write games like Silent Hill 2 Remake or Silent Hill Townfall off on that basis alone. But like I said, I do think there is some degree of truth to that criticism, and I think now is the best time to determine how true it is. In advance of the new Silent Hill games releasing, I thought it would benefit us to go back and look at all four of the Western Silent Hill games to see what things they got wrong and determine to what degree that was attributable to the developer's geography, if at all. But more importantly, what lessons should the new developers be learning from those old games so that the IP can return to its former greatness? Now, I was going to go in order of release, starting with Silent Hill Origins, but I unfortunately don't own a working copy of that game. Plus, when I tried to emulate it, Travis's face kept disappearing, which is a different type of horror, you feel me? The type of horror first-worlders like myself experience when technology doesn't work. Due to this technical snafu, I had no choice but to start with the next one, which, to a lot of people, is the worst out of all of them. Silent Hill Homecoming. Now, why is Silent Hill Homecoming often considered the worst of the Western Silent Hill games? Well, some of the common arguments include It made Silent Hill an action game. The combat was clunky. The only reliable melee weapon is the knife. Some of the puzzles made no sense. The story was a complete retread of Silent Hill 2. The game was far too linear. It completely messed up the lore. There's no reason for the main character to see sexy nurses because the psychosis isn't a product of a repressed sexuality like James in the second game. <coughs> <coughs> yes, there's a lot of truth to that. However, there are certain realities regarding the game's development that I think make some of those faults less offensive. Some of those realities are related to their Western status, but some aren't. I will go into a bit of the development history first and then detail some of the game's cons as well as their pros. And best of all, I intend to do so without any story spoilers. So if you're inclined to go and check out Homecoming at some point, you can safely watch this video. To begin, I will be drawing from a video titled There Was No Team Silent by a YouTuber named The Gaming Muse. Quickly, if you haven't heard of The Gaming Muse or watched any of his videos, you really should. The degree of research and concise delivery in their videos, be it on Silent Hill or other franchises, is something I persistently try to emulate. 
In that video, Gaming Muse provides statistics regarding franchise sales as well as the makeup of the team behind the original four Silent Hill games. In summary, the first game was a major success, selling over 2 million copies worldwide with the majority of the sales being outside of Japan. After that, however, the team behind the first game began to exponentially fragment. The subsequent games became more expensive, and each new entry saw a smaller return on investment. I can't believe I'm going to say this out loud, but I don't blame Konami for looking at these factors and wanting to take a different business approach. What I do blame them for, however, is the approach they chose. Even if the sales were declining, the Silent Hill franchise was, and is, still the most popular horror gaming IP next to Resident Evil. If you genuinely wanted to maintain that status, you wouldn't give Silent Hill 5 to a newly founded company made up of developers responsible for games like The Da Vinci Code and Terminator 3. Moreover, you wouldn't take a completely hands-off approach with that brand new company. What Konami should have done is appoint a creative consultant to ensure that new developers would not tread upon pre-established lore or ruin things that worked well previously. Most importantly, unless you're willing to bet your bottom f***ing dollar that the developers can pull off a radical stylistic overhaul like what Resident Evil 4 did, you don't turn Silent Hill into an action game. When you give the player character more agency, more options to attack enemies and defend themselves, it takes away that feeling of horrific vulnerability that characterized the first four games. Given this state of affairs, I think one can still criticize Konami and Double Helix, the developers, for how they handled things, but with the caveat that Konami should receive more blame and the developers should receive a degree of mercy. Given the way development was structured, Double Helix could have easily turned Homecoming into an abysmal, non-functional disaster. But instead, we received an average to above average horror title that, at times, demonstrates respect for the Silent Hill franchise. Not only that, it demonstrates, in a couple of places, that Western developers do understand traditionally Eastern psychological horror and can incorporate it into their games. I will use Silent Hill 4 to set up some of the things that Homecoming did right. Even though I like 4 overall, there were certain things that game did with the Silent Hill formula that I thought were unwise. Unlike the first three games, where many of the levels were shrouded in almost opaque darkness and fog, much of Silent Hill 4 was well lit and easy to see. While this did not negate the horror and the tension for some people, it did for me. So you can imagine how happy I was that Homecoming brought that design ethic back for almost the entire game. When you can't see your environments or your enemies clearly, the tension naturally rises as your imagination fills in the blanks. And your imagination will conjure up greater horrors than anything the developers can design. This is part of what made the original game so tense, and Double Helix demonstrated that understanding here. That tension is amplified, at least for me, when the game's camera is pulled up close to the character and is slow to move around. This is one of the other things that Silent Hill 4 got rid of from the first three games. The first three brought the camera in closer or fixed it in parts in order to give you less time to adjust and make you feel more claustrophobic. In 4, the camera is pulled out, which allows you to see incoming enemy attacks sooner and benefit from extra time to prepare, which lessens the horror. With Homecoming, the designers, once again, recaptured those original feelings of claustrophobia to a degree. Not always. See, unfortunately, the more action-oriented combat does lessen the horror in certain circumstances. But there are times where you will be in tight hallways with multiple enemies, and your chances of survival will seem minimal. That is when Silent Hill is at its best, and Homecoming has some of those moments. But the game's strengths are not merely limited to times where it is slightly better than Silent Hill 4. Some of the strengths are close to the same level of quality we have always received from the franchise. The world design, be it the Fog World or the Other World, are top notch. Exactly what I would expect from a post-PS2 era Silent Hill game. 
The creature design carries the same level of symbolism and uncategorizable gruesomeness from past games. Even though there are some symbolic monsters which shouldn't be there, and don't worry, we're getting to that. And of course, the music of Akira Yamaoka, peace be upon him, which though not as iconic as it was in the first three games, still conveys those feelings of melancholic contemplation. Honestly, this man's music is like the musical equivalent of ice cream, or pizza. You just add it to any situation and things just immediately get better. At times, all of these factors come together to provide me with a classic Silent Hill experience that I legitimately enjoyed. It was enough to convince me that the developers at Double Helix did respect the Silent Hill license and wanted to understand what made the old games great so they could replicate that success. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, that understanding didn't carry over to other parts of the game, and the mistakes that were made were gross enough to make some people label this game the worst in the series. There were two major mistakes that this game made that, in my opinion, are enough to lower it to the bottom of the hierarchy. First, the combat. Oh my god, the combat. So, what made the gameplay in the first four games, and to an extent in Origins, so effective was the fact that successful combat encounters were not rare, but not usual. In almost every instance, we try to run past the enemies so that we could save our bullets and health for boss encounters. To engage in battle with all the minor enemies would pose too great a risk to our resources. In Silent Hill Homecoming, that old combat system is replaced with something more action-oriented. You can now dodge out of the way of incoming attacks, and you can freely aim your weapons. Half of the time, this new system does take away those feelings of vulnerability which made those other games so scary. For some enemies, you will easily read their attack patterns and deal with them handily. You won't lose much of your health or your ammo, which lessens the horror. However, there are many enemies where it feels like it doesn't matter if you learn their patterns or change your attack strategy, and this is because there are many times where it feels like the dodge button simply doesn't work. It's like you have to be standing at a pixel-perfect spot next to the enemy and then dodge in a pixel-perfect way in order to avoid some of their attacks. Otherwise, 99% of the time, you're gonna get hit. It's not like a Soulsborne game where if you die, you understand that you are at fault and properly learn the enemy's attack patterns for next time. With Homecoming, successful combat encounters largely feel like a consequence of luck rather than skill. Now some people put this down to incompetent game design, which is very likely, but I wonder if it's more complicated than that. I wonder if in the middle of game development, enough people at Double Helix realized that this combat system lessened the horror, and so they purposefully compromised it to increase those feelings of vulnerability. In other words, maybe Double Helix made it so you can master the combat system, but to do so is so tricky and unfun that most people would avoid combat were necessary, like we always did in Silent Hill games. While I do think a combat system can be created that balances action and vulnerability, I don't think Double Helix was adequately equipped to accomplish such an ambitious task, if that was in fact what they were trying to do. In the end, the system we received was neither satisfying from an action standpoint or terrifying from a vulnerability standpoint. Everything just ended up feeling clunky. And when you're dealing with that for the entire game, it's enough to make Homecoming rank at the bottom of the list. It's hard to say, though, whether this system is a consequence of them being Western developers. I don't think that adding an action element to the gameplay is a product of Western sensibilities. And as I just laid out, I think it's reasonable to suspect that they did understand what made the old gameplay great, but just couldn't evolve it. But where I do attribute some of that lack of understanding, as does virtually every Silent Hill fan I know, is with Homecoming's story and how it treats pre-existing lore. While I do think Double Helix deserves some credit in that the majority of things they do don't mess up the lore, enough mistakes were made to leave a permanent stain on the game's reputation. The primary example is with the monster symbolism. 
While the symbolism of most of the monsters is relevant to the characters in the game, monsters like the Nurses and Pyramid Head are not. They should not be there, just like they shouldn't have been in the Silent Hill movie. The design of the Nurses was borrowed from Silent Hill 2, and the Nurses took that form in that game to symbolize James's repressed sexuality which was a ubiquitous theme in Silent Hill 2's monster design. This is not the case in Homecoming. Same thing for Pyramid Head. The creator of that character, Masahiro Ito, has explicitly stated that Pyramid Head was a character exclusively designed for James, and it's for that exact same reason. I won't go into all the reasons for that here, because that would take too long. If you're curious though, check out my video titled Who Pyramid Head Is, which I will link in the description box. One thing I will say about Pyramid Head though, to link things back to this video's core theme, is that the decision to include him appeared to be made by Double Helix. The lead designer behind Homecoming, Jason Allen, demonstrated that he understood the monsters needed to be symbolic of somebody's emotional state. But the reason he gives for Pyramid Head's appearance is flimsy. He says it is due to a myth that a bunch of parents started about a quote-unquote boogeyman to keep children out of trouble. But why is it that the boogeyman must necessarily take on Pyramid Head's appearance? After all, two of the three children's drawings of the boogeyman don't feature a boogeyman that looks like Pyramid Head. Now I will give the devil their due. There is a contingent of people who will not care about symbolic consistency. There will be people who are content to see a creepy monster design, and that will satisfy them. And more power to those people, sincerely, I mean that. That said, there are a lot of people like myself who perceive Silent Hill as an intuitive experience, where you discover hidden meanings for yourself. Much like the works of David Lynch or Stephen King, which Silent Hill was largely based on. We don't enjoy Silent Hill for the visuals. We enjoy it for both the visuals and the twisted part of the human psyche that those visuals represent. When that underlying consistency is taken away, people like myself can detect that, and it throws off our enjoyment. There are other things regarding the lore that I could bring up, like why sacrificing children would prevent the advent of the God of Silent Hill, even though the previous games established that that's not how it works. But stuff like that would be considered a bit too inside baseball, even for big Silent Hill fans like myself. There are also other aspects of the gameplay, like how the levels were much more linear compared to the dizzying labyrinths which gave the original game so much charm. But you know, not everybody is going to be against the idea of a linear experience. And even with the linearity we got, there were several moments of classic Silent Hill gameplay where you avoid monsters in tight hallways, check all the doors, gather all the supplies you can, and try to maintain them before the boss fights. So as I stand back and look at the factors that contributed to Homecoming's failure and success, I deduce that while these faults are enough to make Silent Hill fans rank it at the bottom of the pack, I wonder if that sentiment extends to the average fan. I think if you're sensitive to horror, you don't care about consistency, and you can tolerate the combat, you can have a decent experience with Homecoming. Which again, is remarkable for a first-time studio with no creative control from the producers. Moreover, I cannot help but notice that while Double Helix's western predisposition did lessen the game's quality in some respects, there's more evidence to suggest that they did understand what made the original games great. Again, if they had a steward of the franchise to say no to a couple of their decisions early on, Homecoming probably would have not just been above average at best, but maybe even a good or great Silent Hill game. Unfortunately, what happened has happened, and all we can do is hope new developers don't repeat these same mistakes. Those are my thoughts on Silent Hill Homecoming. Do you agree with my thoughts, or do you disagree? Let me know in the comment section below. Make sure to hit that like button if you like this video. Special thanks to Indy once again for helping me edit this video. Finally, make sure to subscribe, because there's a lot more Silent Hill content coming down the pipeline. Until next time, remember to stay safe and stay yellow.